Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Epic Fantasy Romance. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Delicious. Today is, say it with me, Friday, uh, March 10th, day after my mother's birthday. Uh, I did wish her a birthday yesterday, but sending out a special belated podcast birthday to her today. Happy birthday. Uh, she's been very good about not complaining about the fact that I've reduced the number of podcasts a week. Either that or she hasn't figured it out. She's been too busy birthdaying. But for those who did not hear it, on uh, Monday, I decided to go to uh, two days a week, just recording the podcast on Mondays and Fridays to try to give myself a little bit more energetic bandwidth to get the books written. So uh, if you've been following along, you know that I've been trying to increase word count this last week or so, uh, shooting for 4,000 words a day. And I haven't hit 4,000 words a day yet, but Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I did get 3,000 words a day, over 3,000 words a day. So, so far this week, I've written over 11,000 words, uh, which is um, pretty good. <laughs> It's certainly the best that I have done since um, since the last week of May, first week of June last year. That's the most words I've gotten in a week, and I've still got today to go. So today and tomorrow, I am still going to be trying to do like a thousand words on Saturday and Sunday and see how that goes. So I feel like I'm definitely getting there with what I need to do on this book. I don't have a lot of room, but I'm on track to potentially finish by the end of March and get it out. Uh, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Um, writing this many words a day does make me tired. And <laughs> if you've been following the podcast for a long time, you know this is something I've been thinking about, working about, uh, working on, you know, trying to improve my training, you know, like treat it as a kind of strength training program or marathon training. And I, I wish that it didn't make me, didn't leave me so mentally exhausted uh, when I'm done writing. But if wishes were horses, right? Um, one thing that I'm finding is that by shooting for 4,000 words a day, I'm now at least reliably hitting 3,000 words a day, except for yesterday. Yesterday was a bad day. We're not going to talk about yesterday. Uh, <laughs> yesterday was kind of a crash day. So I think it was Megan Sienna Deutsch who commented, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, who said that, she feels like if she shoots for like 4,000 or 5,000 words a day that she, you know, then comes down. She doesn't quite get that far, but then she's happy with what she does hit. So I'm wondering if instead of thinking about this like marathon training, if maybe I should think about it like strength training, that leaving myself tired at the end of the day is like having sore muscles. And that if my muscles and ligaments are sore, that that actually means that I am correctly training, right? You know, that means that you're building up the muscles. And then you do have to have healing days in between, right? So, so we'll see. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that I've upped my progress, my production so much. Uh, over the last week, 10 days. So maybe I can keep going and maybe next week, who knows, maybe I'll shoot for 5,000 words a day in order to get this book done. Maybe I'll be in a place where I can produce more, lift more weights. Uh, other things I've been doing, it's just been a really crazy week too. Uh, today I have no obligations. I have no meetings. So that's going to be great. I'm really happy to be able to, um, just devote the time to getting the words in. Uh, earlier this week, we did finalist announcements uh, for Nebula finalists. Uh, I had meetings. I 
Wednesday afternoon, I had a meeting in town with a gal who wants to start an author reading series here in Santa Fe. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, went and met her at a local coffee shop, um, did some other things. I was peopling yesterday, writer coffee and board meeting for CIFLA. So um, it's nice to have a day when I don't have to do a whole lot of stuff. I have lots to catch up on, but uh, hopefully I can get that done over the weekend. We're doing a lower word count over the weekend. So um, other things I've been doing is I've been doing some reading for people. I finished reading a book for um, an auction donation that I did. So I will be sending comments on that. I don't know if that author listens to this podcast, but I will send you comments this weekend. And I've been reading for a friend. Oh, wait, I have to say something else first because I do want to talk about POV. Um, but exciting news is this week the article came out in Uncanny Magazine that I wrote on rooting out default patriarchy from your secondary fantasy worlds. Uh, if you've been following the podcast for a long time, you know I've talked about this. I've mentioned it in workshops from time to time about how you have to root out that programmed patriarchy that a lot of authors, when they create secondary fantasy worlds, make them patriarchal by default because we live in a patriarchal world and we don't have to do that. So this article has a whole bunch of tips and tricks, uh, things to evaluate to determine does your fantasy world have patriarchal ideas that you don't intend. If you want to represent a patriarchal world, that's something else. But if you didn't plan to do it that way, then this is how you root that out. Uh, so I will include that link in the show notes. I'm very happy that this came out in Uncanny Magazine. Uh, Meg Ellison did a great job of editing it, and I greatly appreciated, um, you know, everybody at Uncanny was really great to work with, so that was really fun. Happy to have that out there. So, thoughts on uh, POV, point of view. So, while point of view seems to be a fairly straightforward thing, it's actually one of those things that takes a great deal of practice and perfecting the craft in order to get it right. Uh, so point of view, we talk about, uh, there's different angles that we come at point of view. There's the very basic, is it third person, second person, or first person? Um, third person is he did this, she did that, they did this other thing. Second person is you. That's like, well, you did this, you did that. First person is I. I did this, I did that. Uh, most common are first and third. A lot of readers don't like first person. Um, I think that's changed some. And I, and I feel like this is an important thing to talk about with point of view, is that the fashion changes. Uh, what used to be very acceptable and even expected by readers is now uh, uncomfortable to a modern reader. So, uh, and I'll try to address that a little bit. I'm, I've kind of missed my segue on this, that um, I am reading a book for a friend. Uh, we're exchanging critiques, and I have been pointing out places where the POV is, is uneven. And I'm trying to explain this and, and my friend is, is eager to learn and even said, um, you know, asked for like a text or a book to read to study on this. And it's funny because whenever, uh, you know, like I hear people say, well, oh, you know, is there a, a book teaching this craft? I always think, oh, I should write this book uh, in my spare time. I would like to think that um, I could teach it, but I'm not sure how to teach it. I've been mulling over. How would I teach uh, perfecting point of view? So this is sort of my first attempt. So beyond picking first, second, or third person, uh, I'm not a fan of second person for a number of reasons. I don't like it as a reader. 
Uh, I understand why people like it. I know that some writers have used it very effectively. It always feels like command language to me. Uh, I once had a boss who talked in second person, not in giving instructions, but sort of as a, it was, it was kind of her lens on the world that she would say things like, um, you look at those houses and you wonder who lives in them. And I would be like, no, I don't wonder that. But, but this was her perspective. And I think this is what's critical about point of view is that this is the perspective on the story. And so what you choose for POV for a story very much depends on the story, the characters, the tone, what you're trying to do with the story. And more than once I have started a story and one point of view and decided it didn't work and had to go back and change it. Uh, notably, I once changed uh, an entire half of a book from third person to first person. Uh, the Forgotten Empires trilogy is an alternating first person points of view. And like, and other times I have asked Agent Sarah, uh, when we're talking about a project, I've said, uh, you know, would you prefer that I write this in first person or third? And she has come back saying, you decide. She said, whichever one that the story needs, which may, that's part of why she's a really great agent, because it's true that the story will tell you what it needs. Now, that takes some, that's part of why you have to practice a lot, because that does take some refining of intuition, learning to listen to your story brain, to know what POV should a story be in. Uh, I started out writing a first person point of view and later changed to third. And for me, yeah, it just depends on the story. So, so that's one level is to choose that first person, second, third. Most writers are going to choose third. Then you also have this, um, how close is the point of view? And that's where things get trickier because it used to be in literature that there was this very broad omniscient point of view as in the person telling the story, narrating the story, knows everything, knows what's going on inside of the character's heads, knows the history, knows the background, possibly knows the future. Uh, and this is as opposed to, like if you go into a first person point of view, you only know what that person knows, what that character knows. And which is why some readers don't like it because it's, it's a very, very limited point of view, right? Uh, interestingly, and I think importantly, first person point of view is how we live our lives, right? We only have first person point of view. <laughs> you may think that you know what's going on in other people's heads, but we actually don't. Oh, I, I use second person there. You wonder. Uh, I mean, it is useful at times. First person is how we live. We like to tell stories in third person because it, there's a lot of flexibility to it, right? Uh, and it, you know, older stuff, you know, if you look at something like the Odyssey or, you know, like the big narratives, they're essentially told in third person omniscient point of view, right? And the, whoever is telling the story and it can vary, right? You don't really know who is that third person. Is it God? Is it the author? Is it one of the characters? It could be any of these things. Uh, trying to figure out how do they know all of this stuff? Sometimes authors go into contortions, uh, Sometimes the narrator's name, sometimes it's not. Um, sometimes the contortions are a little much. Uh, in Dan Simmons' Fall of Hyperion, he chooses what essentially an artificial intelligence who is able to access neural connections, who can dip in and read people's minds and or their dreams and their memories. 
and then this enables us to have this distant narrator who knows what's going on outside of the characters' lives, but also knows what's going on inside the characters' heads. Um, I mean, I think he pulls it off, and clearly it's a great book, but if you're going into those kinds of contortions to defend how a character is omniscient, do you really need them to be omniscient? What, in some ways, I'm going to put this out here, uh, in some ways, wanting to have omniscient narration is lazy writing. I mean, because, is it fair to say it's lazy? Uh, maybe it's easier writing because you don't have to think about who knows what and why. You could just say, oh, yeah, here's this thing. Here's this background. Here's how they know. Uh, I think that where it becomes a challenge, where it becomes interesting is to know exactly what the limitations of the point of view are and to tell the story within those boundaries. So when we talk about omniscient or close point of view, no matter which, no matter if you're in first, second or third, uh, first almost always demands very, very close point of view, right? But third can be a range, right? And I think the easiest way to think about point of view is to think about where is the camera? Uh, this is sort of our way of, you know, because we live in such a digital video world now, right? So in a, you can have a very, very distant point of view where you have your camera basically panning over the landscape. And, and it's full, full surround, right? You get sound, you get smells, you, you get uh, all of the things that a camera can pick up, right? But it's distant and it's able to see many, many things uh, that you can't see closer to the ground. As the point of view becomes closer, you bring the camera in closer. And so you can choose. The camera could be back here and saying, oh, there is Jeffy doing her podcast. Or the camera can move in front and actually be showing me doing the podcast, right? You can then bring it even closer and move the camera behind the character's heads. So now the camera is recording the exactly what I see in here. So it would be, here's the screen, and this is what is showing on the screen as Jeffy does her podcast. Then you can bring the camera in even closer and put it inside of the character's heads, right? So now the camera would be essentially behind my eyes, and the camera experiences my physical sensations, but it's still a separate camera, as opposed to in first person, it's going to be not able to ever escape my skull. It can't move in and out. So I think that's one way of getting at POV is to think about where is the camera at any given time and what is it recording? Is it actually able to get into my thoughts or is it only showing the exterior of my actions? I think that especially for newer authors, when you're still trying to figure this out, it's really important to pick one POV, one distance, and stay there and practice staying within it. Uh, and as you go back and revise, as you go back and you look at uh, how you're describing things, ask yourself, is this within what the camera sees? Can the, can the camera have picked up these words? Can the camera have known these particular thoughts? And and stay within those boundaries. It's kind of like learning to write poetry by learning to write sonnets. You, you know, practice by staying within a certain rhyme and a certain meter, and then you can start changing it up once you get good at it, and you can do more freeform or painting. You can, uh, you know, you learn to paint or learn to draw by learning perspective and to portray things very, very accurately, and then you start mixing it up. So those are my initial thoughts on POV. Uh, 
If anybody does know of good texts to rec recommend on teaching POV, please let me know. Uh, and I will pass those along. Otherwise, I hope that you all have a great weekend. I hope you get to enjoy. I hope that you get to uh, produce if you want to produce. And I will talk to you all on Monday. You all take care. Bye-bye.